Hi guys, my name is Elin, and we are continuing our conversation about answering the question, how do we stay connected in our marriage? And if you haven't had a chance to listen to the other videos, I encourage you to go ahead and do that first. So now we're gonna move into the fourth category of intimacy, and that is sexual intimacy. And I'm really thankful uh, to be talking about this because I believe that the church should be talking about sexual intimacy. God is the one who created sex. In Genesis 2, verse uh, 24, it says, a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. I mean, that is that union that is taking place physically between a husband and a wife. God created it, and it is a blessing, and it's one that he wants a husband and a wife to enjoy together, and one that has a purpose of not only blessing their marriage and their relationship, but furthering his kingdom and bringing more humans into his kingdom. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of that and how to kind of have that sexual intimacy and the conversations that you should be having with each other to help grow that. But I do want to be clear about one thing first, and that is I know that many people who are going to be watching this video are not yet married. Whether it is that you are engaged and not married, or you're dating and not engaged or married, um, or maybe you aren't dating anyone right now and you're just trying to get some information that will help you in your future relationship. And so first of all, I'm really glad that you're watching this, and I believe it will be beneficial to anyone who wants to have a relationship. But I do just want to be clear that, that you know, marriage is is the place for this sacred this sacred interaction this sexual interaction between a husband and a wife and so as we're talking about this I'm really I'm talking to husbands and wives who are married and I hope that those of you who are not married um, but want to be married or are planning on getting married will just take this information and use it um, for your future for when you do get married so I just want to make that clear before we get started so the reason that we're talking about this topic of sexual intimacy at the end of these other conversations of intimacy is because sexual intimacy actually only happens at the way it's intended when these other areas of intimacy are working well, when we are connecting on an intellectual level, when we are emotionally connecting, and when we are spiritually connected. That is where we see sexual intimacy really be what God intended for it to be is when those other areas are going well and you know we're we're sitting here at answering the question how do we stay connected in our marriage well, connection in in sexual intimacy is is such a powerful a powerful thing between a husband and a wife and the most connected that you can possibly feel is when it's not just the act of sex but it's when all of these other components of intimacy are going well. And that is so very important because you could be having sex with your husband or your wife and there's not the intimate connection that God wants for you and that you want for your marriage. And so it's really important that as we talk about sexual intimacy, that we understand that it's really kind of the last component of these other areas of intimacy and it's important that those other areas are going well and are, are given attention um, and time and, and effort in order for that, 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 that last component, that sexual intimacy component, to really be what, what you want it to be and what God wants it to be for you. So we're talking about staying connected, and right now we're talking about connecting physically. And so I just want to spend a few moments and talk about how do we how do we really get to that connectedness when it comes to the physical part of our relationship? So in order to have the connectedness that we want in our marriage, in order to have that intimacy, we really need to be clear on a couple of things. The first is we have to have some very clear boundaries and safeguards in place in our marriage that you together with your spouse need to decide on ahead of time. Let me just tell, tell you like this. Okay, so Tab and I make it a common conversation to talk about things that are okay or not okay. For example, one time we sat down and said, hey, what is okay in your mind as far as texting another person? And we set parameters and we said, listen, we are, we are fine to text someone of the same gender. So if I text a girlfriend of mine or if he texts a friend, that's fine. 
As far as the opposite gender, we had some very clear reasons that it's okay to text someone of the opposite gender. For example, if it was a work-related conversation with someone of the opposite gender, that was okay. If it was something related to one of our kids, in other words, um, if my daughters are over at a friend's house and the mom has knows I'm not home because I'm at work and the girls are, um, you know, they have a question for Tab or they need to come home for something and she wants to alert him to be on the lookout for them, then she can text him and say, hey, just wanted to let you know the girls are coming to the house. Those kinds of text messages are okay. Uh, beyond that though, Tab and I have agreed in our marriage that if there were any other text messages outside of those two reasons that we would communicate with each other and make sure it's okay. In fact, whenever any of us, either one of us, adds another number to our phone contacts, if it is someone of the opposite gender, we tell each other. In fact, one of uh, the fr a friend of one of my daughters, uh, Tab uh, was, was dropping my daughter off at a friend's house and he came home and he said, I just wanted to let you know that I added our daughter's friend's mom to my phone contact um, because she's gonna text me when it's time for me to come and pick her up. And here's the thing, this is not me being um, controlling of my husband or vice versa. This is us safeguarding and protecting the most important relationship in either of our lives. It's important that you have this conversation with each other. You know, what is okay? What kind of conversations are okay? What kind of, is it okay that you go out to lunch with some of the opposite sex? Um, I would say uh, no, unless it's something specific for a specific reason and something that your spouse is very well aware of and there is a purpose behind it, you know, then you decide that together. But, but I think it's really important to have this conversation to put some protective places, uh, put protective measures in place so that you guys are on the same page. This is important. How does this relate to sexual intimacy? Well, it, it does because this keeps the enemy from invading that holy ground, that territory of your marriage. And when you have clear boundaries that you both have agreed on, then now you know it's protected. And now within those boundaries, there's so much freedom. And there's also trust. And that leads itself to connectedness. And then that leads itself to physical connectedness and that, that, that sexual intimacy that, that you want in your marriage. One more thing on that before we move on, and, and that is to be very, very careful about ever, ever talking to someone of the opposite gender about your marriage. Um, this is a huge red flag. Don't talk to anyone else outside of your marriage of the opposite gender about your marriage. You should talk to your spouse. If you have maybe a parent figure um, or your parent that you need to go to um, or you need to go to a counselor, I'm not talking about that. Obviously, there are some, there are people in our lives that are safe places for us to go to, but it should really be limited to someone who's like a parental figure um, if it's going to be somebody of the opposite sex. And we want to make sure too that we never say anything to anyone, even if it's like women, if you're talking to your girlfriends um, or a trusted friend, be very, very, very careful about the words that you speak. And make sure that, that you never are saying anything that is, is disrespectful or undermining about your husband. And husbands, same thing to you. We really want to protect, um, you really want to protect your wife, protect um, the intimacy that you have with her by not sharing details with anyone else outside of your marriage. Just talking to each other and working through that together or together seeking that outside help um, is, is very, very important. So another way to really protect that connectedness, to experience that connectedness, especially when we're talking about sexual intimacy, um, and I, I understand that this could be a sensitive uh, topic, but it's, it's one we need to be talking about anyway. And so um, I, I just wanna say this, don't turn each other down when it comes to being intimate. There's some scripture on this, and I'm gonna go ahead and read it to you. It's in 1 Corinthians 7, verses one through five. Now regarding the questions you asked in your letter, yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations, but because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman should have her own husband. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. 
Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so that you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to, to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I love scripture, it is so powerful. And, and here we have the word of God telling us the importance of sharing our bodies freely with our spouse and understanding that in doing so, we're actually safeguarding and protecting it from the enemy. Um, the human desire is a real one, and we wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep that within the, the context and um, within the marriage between a husband and a wife. It's so important. And so um, obviously there are things that come up, illnesses or periods of separation, maybe if somebody's traveling for work, um, or, or you've just had a baby. Uh, there, there are certainly circumstances that come up that you, where you have to abstain for a while, but it's something that you've agreed on as a couple. But other than those circumstances, I cannot encourage you enough to make sure that you frequently engage intimately with each other. Now that word frequently can mean different things for different people in different seasons of life. And that's actually between you and your spouse. And that's something that actually Tab and I talk about on a regular basis and I want to encourage you to do as well. We kind of hold these temperature check conversations or meetings um, between the two of us where we talk about things in our relationship. And one of those things that we talk about is our sexual intimacy. And we'll say things like, okay, well, um, how many, like how often should we be intimate right now? I mean, if certain seasons are happening in your life where you're really busy, where there's a lot of stress happening, uh, where you maybe have uh, someone living in your house that's outside of your family, or you just had a baby who was born, or, um, or any number of things that can come in and kind of take away from that sexual intimacy being even taking place to begin with. It is really important and really powerful to sit down and talk about that. Talk about your expectations. How often should we? Um, is this reasonable for you? And you know what you might find is actually you guys can get on the same page really quickly um, because um, it's just silly for us to think that we can guess what the other person um, thinks is often enough. Uh, then uh, we just shouldn't assume. Um, having the conversation puts it out there and then you get to make a decision together. And you can say, no, this is actually in this season of our life where we are, this is what we've agreed is a normal, frequent amount of time that's gonna work for us. And in different seasons, it may be more often, and in different seasons, seasons, it may be less often. But the thing is, is that you've made that decision together. And that is you and your spouse being unified in a very important aspect of your marriage. And so I encourage you to have those conversations. And we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. Another note on that is when you're talking about the frequency of when you're intimate, it's also a really great opportunity for you to talk about the expectations you have, your likes and your dislikes in, in, in that intimate moment. Uh, it's important to communicate, talking, communicate with your spouse is like it's such a beautiful thing. And uh, God wants to bless your sexual intimacy in your marriage. He, he absolutely does. It is a blessing. It's something he created. And so he he wants you and your spouse to connect verbally and talk about what does that look like for your marriage and, and the different needs and, and, and hopes that you have for that area of your marriage. And so this is a really good thing. And I just, I hope that if nothing else, that, that this video um, or this portion of it will just give you permission to have that conversation. And that's a good conversation to have. It doesn't need to be awkward. Um, it can be really fun and lighthearted and, um, and even humorous as well. So don't be afraid to have that conversation. Okay, another thing that I want you to understand, I want all of us to understand, is that there is great freedom in the marital bed. Um, meaning God, God gives us freedom in our relationship with our spouse. And, and I know that this may be kind of an awkward conversation, but this is uh, an important one as well. And that is um, that, that, you, that you protect, um, but know there's freedom uh, within the intimate setting you know, in your marriage or in those moments that are intimate in your marriage. And, and really, I would just say this, that um, to have this filter in your mind, ask yourself the question, um, is this something 
is what we're doing or what we're talking about doing in, in, as far as intimacy is concerned, um, is this something that has the potential to be unhealthy in any way, physically or mentally? That's a really good filter to have. So as you guys are having that conversation about sharing about things that you, you know, that you want to see happen in, in your intimacy with each other, really making sure that you have a solid filter of, is there anything that could potentially be physically or mentally unhealthy about what we're talking about? An example of that would be introducing pornography into your marriage. Now listen, if you, if your marriage, if you guys have experienced that in some way or another, there's no shame, okay, no shame, but I just, I cannot recommend quickly or highly enough that you, that you stop that. You don't enter any of that into your marriage because that would be in that filter that I'm talking about. That would be an area where it has great potential, great potential to become very quickly unhealthy, either emotionally um, or mentally um, or even physically. And so I just want to um, encourage you to, to sit down and have a conversation openly and freely. Know that there's freedom in the marital bed, that God wants to bless that that moment that you have, but he also wants to protect it. He wants to protect it and keep it the sacred, the sacred connection that it truly is meant to be. And so make sure that you really take seriously, is this something that is healthy in every way, or is there any threat to any emotional or mental or physical health by anything that we are discussing or any decision that we're making? One of uh, my favorite uh, kind of conversations about sexual intimacy and how to help grow it is touching each other often, hugging each other, kissing each other. Um, it doesn't mean making out in public, okay? I, I'm saying specifically like make sure you're physically touching each other every day. Uh, there are a lot of marriages where that physical component is is nowhere to be found outside of the bedroom. And that is not that is not what we want. That is not what's going to get us that, that intimacy that we all want um, to have in the bedroom. And so it's really important that you find ways to physically touch each other, whether it's giving each other a hug goodbye or a kiss hello or holding hands when you're watching TV or putting an arm around each other in church. You know, physically touching one another and being um, connected in that way. It doesn't have to be a, a, a sexual touch, um, although there's nothing wrong with that in marriage either, um, but, but it, it's just a physical touch of just being physically present with one another. It's so important to nurture that aspect of your intimacy and of your marriage. And on that note, uh, ladies, I just want to say to you, I know that sometimes we can get self-conscious about our bodies. And so if our husband comes up and wraps his arms, you know, around our waist, we may be inclined to say, oh, I feel so fat or oh, good, an inch away. And don't do that. <laughs> don't do that because here's the thing that, that, that um, I've learned over the years with Tab is that I may feel a way about myself, but he doesn't. And your husband, when he touches you, whether he puts his arms around your waist or however he shows his affection to you, receive it. Receive it and don't say anything that could squash that. Uh, it's really, really important that not only, and this kind of goes back to that conversation that we had about emotional intimacy, about being a good giver and a receiver. It's also important in the area of sexual intimacy or this connectedness physically that we have throughout the day and that we should have throughout the day with our spouse. So the next time your husband wants to hug you around the waist, let him and know that he's hugging you and he thinks you are awesome. Uh, one of the other suggestions that I have, and, and this one I'm really passionate about, and, and this is actually one of the harder, the harder components um, in certain circumstances, but say I love you to your spouse as often as you get the chance. Now, you may be wondering, why is that hard to do? Uh, well, it's, it's not hard to do when everything is going well. <laughs> But let's just say that you've gotten in an argument with your spouse and you are about to head off to work and so you're leaving each other for a good portion of the day and you've just gotten in an argument. Maybe the last thing you wanna say is, I love you. But I cannot stress it enough that that's exactly when you should say it. I, personally speaking, I will never forget uh, the last interaction I had with my father um, was right before he died. He was killed in a car accident. So it can happen suddenly. I had no you know, expectation that this was going to happen. But we had a conversation and um, we got off the phone, or right before we got off the phone, and I told him that I loved him. 
And I was a teenager at the time, and my mom had told me he had had a hard day, and he wanted to talk to me on the phone, and that, you know, just be easy on your dad, she said. And so I had that in mind when I talked to him, so I was really intentional about telling him that I loved him. And I will tell you, I mean, I am so very, 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 very thankful that I took that opportunity to tell him I loved him, even though my, it was at the suggestion of my mom, uh, because that was the last time I talked to my father. And I don't want to be morbid on this or negative. But the truth remains that none of us know when our day has come to go and be with the Lord and leave this earth. And it would just be such a shame if the very last thing our, our spouse who's left here on earth has um, is a fight and not the opportunity to say, I love you. And so my husband knows. Um, we've talked about this over the years I'm, and, and my children as well. It is very, very important in our family and in my marriage that no matter what issue we are working through, that no one is to ever part from each other without some kind of show of love, whether it's I love you or a hug or a kiss. And it doesn't mean anybody has to be happy about it either. But I don't want for my last words or last moments uh, with anybody that I love for that matter, but especially my husband, to be anything less than love. And I just wanna encourage you, you know, this does relate to sexual intimacy. Um, it really, really does. It has an impact on what those intimate moments are like by how you express uh, your words of love to each other in moments where you're not physically being intimate. It actually helps to bless that ahead of time. And so being intentional about saying I love you is so important. In fact, just take a second right now and look at each other. Look at each other right now and in the most heartfelt way you can, say I love you. Why don't you do that real quick? All right, good job. <laughs> okay, so the next suggestion I have is to flirt with each other. This is so important. You know, I mean, if you think about your relationship and the journey that you've had in your marriage, think back to when you were dating or when you first met, or when you were, were getting married and, and shortly after you got married, and, and, and just think of the best times in your, in your relationship. And I am just certain that you had flirting going on. And, 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 and I, that can look in so many different ways, like so many different things. It could be, you know, just a, a flirty text message. It could be a suggestion um, or an inside joke that has suggestive uh, meaning behind it. It could be um, a physical touch of, of some sort. Um, it could be, you know, a look in the eyes. It could be something that you say. It can, it can be any number of things. Uh, but flirt with each other, um, date each other, have fun together, laugh together. Uh, make sure that you are incorporating times of lighthearted connectedness. Um, you know, it's so easy to get serious. Um, about everything because you know we live in a world where there's a lot of stuff going on there's a lot of problems happening there's a lot of things that could really cause us to, to stress and fear and worry um, and and honestly it, it, we don't need to take everything so seriously I mean if we are Christians and we believe that God is sovereign and he holds it all together and he's got a good plan for our lives and he wants to bless our marriage and you know the person that you're sitting across from right now is God wants that to be your best friend and maybe you've lost that a little bit over time, or maybe that's something that um, you, you, you haven't quite found um, to begin with. And so I just, I just, I don't know, I just want you to know that, that that is a desire that God has for you to enjoy your marriage. So flirt with each other and laugh and be silly and send each other notes and, and just do things to just spice up and enjoy your relationship with each other. So another way to really bless our sexual intimacy in our marriages um, is actually comes from a verse in Ephesians. Each of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. And so what this has to do with sexual intimacy is just husbands and wives understanding how the other person feels loved. And um, women, husbands feel loved by our respect for them. Uh, respecting our husbands is such an important way for them to feel our love and to really um, grow in our connectedness and our intimacy, um, all types of intimacy with him. And so, you know, respecting your husband um, would mean things like uh, supporting decisions that he believes are right, that he's making for the family. Uh, it's, it's, it's encouraging him, telling him what a good job he's doing, 
Thank you for working hard for the family. Um, how was work today? Hey, you did such a great job on this or on that, or I really loved how you, how you spoke to the kids a few minutes ago, or, you know, I just want you to know that uh, I really appreciate all that you do for our family or, or how hard you work um, that allows me to have the ability to go buy some clothes or stay at home with our children. Or, you know, thank you so much that you encourage me in my career and in the ways that I want to grow. And, um, you know, thank you for who you are as a man. And, 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 you know, respecting your husband isn't just about what you do to his face. Respecting your husband is about behind his back as well. And what kind of words are we speaking about our husbands when they're not around and when they have no chance of knowing? It's really important as a wife that we understand the power that we have in our marriage and in our husband's life and that we should always speak life over them and to them and about them. So that means that when we're with our friends, even after an argument that we had, that we make sure that we never say anything that would in any way be disrespectful to or about our husbands. It's very, very important that we make sure that we respect our husbands. That's how they feel loved. And when they feel respected and loved, then that connectedness in the way that we as women experience in the intimate realm, they're gonna to wanna to be more eager to meet those needs that we have if we are seeking to show them our love by respecting them. And husbands, if you want to experience you know, a thriving intimate life with your wives, understand that the way she experiences or receives or, or feels loved is through different ways than you do. You know, a woman wants to be listened to. She wants her husband to make eye contact with her. She wants him to understand. She wants him to put a hand on her hand or on her leg or, or wrap his arm around her and say, I'm with you and I love you. You know, to thank her, to tell her that she's beautiful, to encourage her to tell her all the things that you love and appreciate about her, not just think them in your mind, but actually tell her those things. You know, it's different for every woman. Um, every woman receives love in a different way, but I would challenge each of you husbands to, to, to ask your wife, hey, what, what can I do to help you feel the most loved? And see, what you're gonna find is that when women feel safe to be vulnerable in that way, and when they feel loved by their husband, then they're going to want to have that intimate connection with you. They, they're going to want to connect with you. They're going to want that more frequently um, because they are getting the love that they need. So keep this in mind um, and know that by, by God's word here, that a, that a man um, receives love through respect and, and men love your wives as yourself, that by doing that, it's going to, God's going to use that to bless your sexual intimacy as well. So another way that you can really bless your sexual intimacy um, in your marriage is to plan date nights throughout the month. This is really important. And I would recommend that it's one to two date nights a month at least. If you can do more than that, go for it. Um, but it's really, really important. And I understand that, that there are many situations that come up that make this more difficult than others. Uh, for one, it could be finances. Let's say that money is tight right now and you really can't afford to be going out and, um, and spending money on a meal or in a movie or whatever you do for fun. That's okay. There are so many of my favorite dates that I've had with Tab that cost nothing. My favorite date that we had actually was when a friend of ours watched our children for about three hours. We went home, it was the middle of winter, and we built a fire and we got out our favorite board games and we played games for hours. And we just laughed and we made some food and we sat there on the floor in front of the fireplace and it was only a couple of hours, but it is one of my favorite dates that I've ever had with my husband, and it did not cost a dime. It didn't cost a dime as far as what we were doing, and it didn't cost a dime as far as childcare. So if you have children and you're worried about, well, I don't have any money or I don't have family that live nearby, 
find a neighbor or a good friend, um, a couple who has children, and maybe they could swap. So you could take turns going on different on dates, um, and and the other couple will watch your child, and then you can you can pay back the favor by watching their children so that they go on a date. Um, there's lots of ways to get creative. Another way is to wait until your children go to bed, and I know that that may not be the most ideal uh, setting for a date night, but another thing, you know, Tab and I've had wonderful date nights. The kids go to bed and. We decide we're gonna have a late meal and we cook out steaks on the grill and we sit out on the patio and we light a candle, turn on some music and, and we just sit there. The kids are in bed and we're just together. And the point here isn't the cost of it, of the date. It's not where you are. It's about being intentional and it's about the quality of the time together. It's, it's, it's not just, oh, well, our kids happen to not be here, so let's just go out to eat, which those are nice moments too, because spontane you know, spontaneity is, is a blessing to a marriage. But it's actually even, even more beneficial for the long run to be intentional about setting up those dates ahead of time. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Another recommendation uh, is for you and your spouse to plan a retreat. And I recommend a retreat to be uh, once a quarter, if possible, but no less than two times a year. Now, a retreat, um, by my definition, is at least 24 hours with no interruption. And specifically, the retreat is designed to pour into your marriage. That means that a retreat would not be where you're involving other couples. You can do that and go on trips with other couples, and that's wonderful, but I'm not, that's not a retreat that I'm talking about. I'm talking about a couple of times a year where you have planned out 24 hours where you and your spouse are going to get away together uninterrupted for the purpose of pouring into your marriage. So Tab and I call that a retreat. One of my favorite retreats that we ever had was actually one night away. We went downtown uh, to Marietta and we stayed at a, a hotel right there on the golf course. We booked a round of golf and we played some golf and we went out to dinner in, the, in, in downtown Marietta. And then we came back and we sat out on the porch at the hotel um, and we just chatted and we watched the sunset go down. And then the next morning we woke up and we went out to breakfast and, um, and then we went home. And I felt we were only four miles away from home. And I felt like we had been to another state and, and were gone for far longer than the amount of time that we were gone. And that's because the time that we were together was very focused and very intentional. And during that time in our retreat, the way that we were intentional about our relationship was we sat down, we actually built in time um, to sit down and talk about our marriage and how things were going. Earlier I talked about, I used the term temperature check. And, and a temperature check for Tab and me is just where we sit down and say, how are things going between us? You know, how are things going? And not just intimately, by the way, not just sexual intimacy, I'm just talking in general. Like, how is it going? How are you? How are we? You know, what, what needs addressing? What do we need to work on? What's going really well? What are the things that we want to implement in our marriage that, um, that maybe we see other successful marriage uh, couples doing? Uh, what is it that we need more of? I mean, you just have this conversation, but if you on the forefront know that, hey, we're doing it, we're planning a retreat, um, then you're going to be really intentional about saying, okay, what do we need to talk about on this retreat? So know that a retreat is not just 24 hours away, but it's also a time for you to be very intentional about talking about your marriage. Um, a retreat can also be longer than 24 hours, and that's delightful if you can pull that off. Um, but sometimes, you know, in the seasons of life and depending on finances, that's really difficult. So again, if you are, are you know, strapped for money, just know that you can get really creative with this. Maybe asking a, a friend or a family member, can you take the kids for 24 hours? And you guys just stay at home and have a staycation where you say, we're gonna be unplugged. We're not gonna do any household chores. We are just gonna plan out this time to do the things here together that we wanna do. Maybe it's going on a walk. Uh, maybe it is going out to, to dinner. Maybe it's cooking in. Don't let finances or having children or no childcare ever stop you from being intentional about spending quality time more than just a few hours, but literally 24 hours or more together at least twice a year, but I encourage once a quarter.